grace and peace. Welcome to Sabbath School Study Group, where we are in the last of our five-part series on America and Babylon, as understood through the prophecies of Revelation. And we conclude with the deadly wound healed. This is a summary of what we've looked at, but we encourage you to go back, listen, watch the studies. In fact, make sure you visit that link at changeministry.org slash the highway home, where you'll find an interactive study that explains all of the major prophetic events to happen from now until the coming of Christ. And recognizing that one of them is this sign of the deadly wound healing. Is it so? Well, let's go to the book to find out, because in Daniel 12, 1, in our focus verse, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And so, Lord, we pray, bring our study to its conclusion, but our faith to a new beginning, in the name of Jesus, amen. So now, as we understand this idea, this this verse or phrase of the deadly wound being healed, this is a direct reflection of what's being told for up from not just Revelation, but even from the book of Daniel. But here we see in Revelation 13, the reminder that Rome will be what it was. The wound would be healed because in Revelation 13, it says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. This is one of the 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 heads on the beast that symbolizes the nation of Rome or the Roman Catholic Church. And one of his heads had a wound and his deadly wound was healed. And in this healing, all the world wondered after this healed beast. This is Revelation 13, 3. And we found now in verse 8 that all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, shall worship this beast whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So when we were reading what Daniel refers to as the book, John the Revelator sees now, and this is known as the book of life. This is the book to be in. This is the book that Jesus put everyone's name in when he died on the cross. But by our choices, we choose to be deleted or removed. But hey, if your name is not written in that book, the Bible says, will find ourselves worshiping the beast. And it will be because he had power in verse 15 to give life into the image of the beast. This is the second beast. This is the beast that comes out of the land or out of an unpopulated area. It rises at the time of the sea beast's decline. So as the beast is declining in 1798, what nation, what superpower do we see ascending around that time? This nation around 1776 is on the ascent and in an unpopulated area, it becomes a superpower that we now know as the United States. And Revelation 13 says that there will come a time that the United States will cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. These are solemn words. These are words of 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 real contemplation, but they are not words of fear. Because as we read the chapter, we understand that both beasts come to an end. Both beasts meet their consummation at the hand of Christ. But we have to recognize these entities so that we might be aware of where we should be. And the Bible warns us in Revelation 18 to come out of her. And this is not an indictment on a sincere individual. In fact, it's an invitation to the sincere individual to follow truth, to follow light as it leads. And as we find in Scripture, Revelation or the book of revealing lets us know where we ought not to be to know then where we ought to be because it has never changed. In other words, Rome will be what it was. It's not some accusation. It's not me throwing dirt or or me being uh, in some way accusatory, but Rome will be what it was because it has never changed from what it was. And we all know historically what has the Roman Catholic Church done? Well, we know it as the Dark Ages. And the Bible makes it plain here in Revelation 13. There was given to him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given to him to continue 40 and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. This is the biblical record of the behavior of this beast. Has Rome recanted of its own doctrine? Has the Roman Catholic Church 
in some way found itself wrong on the wrong side of the Reformation and repented? No. In fact, it has gone full steam ahead in a counter-reformation because it says there in Jeremiah 8, I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rusheth into the battle. Friends, the church has not changed because as it came face to face with the reality and the power and the righteousness of the Reformation, it's at that time that we see the inception of the soldiers of Christ or uh, the order of Christ or more commonly known as the Jesuits to then operate and function in a counter reformation against what the Lord had clearly given the reformers. This is not repentance. This is revolution. This is a revolt against reformation and having not changed its beliefs, how then can it truly change its behavior? It can hide it. It can hold back, but it cannot change its behavior. That's why Daniel 7 says, I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in his horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. I have no record or recollection of the church recognizing that a man cannot be God. I do not hear of the Bishop of Rome that we know as the Pope making any type of confession that he is just a Christian. He's just a man. No, instead, I see affirmations of faith. I see continuance of false theologies, that he is God on earth, that he is divine, that his word even trumps the word of God himself. These are the things that still stand, and that is why the Vatican still stands today. I see no one tearing down an Egyptian obelisk, the largest in the world, the largest put in the court of the house of God with a cross placed on the top. This is an occult phallic symbol. But with Christ and his cross upon the top? No, this is not a refusal of truth. This is not just a, an outright denial. This is a mingling of truth and error. Some even call it a baptizing of paganism. This is at the heart. It's in the very front yard of the church. And it will be what it was because it has not changed. It has not repented. But here is the good news for you and for me. While an institution may not repent, while an organization may not find its way, friends, while the world wonders, we can walk with Jesus. While the world wonders after the beast, Jesus let us know that we can walk with him. He's like a good father. He'll, he'll slow down and hold out his hand, hold out his fingers so he can just grab a hold. And he leads and keeps us the rest of the way. This is the invitation to those who are faithful, who believe in the Bible and not in a man because John 10 27 says Jesus says my sheep these are the sheep of Jesus hear my voice and I know them and they follow me brother I encourage you I insist I encourage you even if you are a part of the Roman Catholic uh, 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 church guess what the Lord has promised his sheep hear his voice I don't care where you are if you're not even in church you're in the club you're in the bar you're in your bedroom, you're in your car, and you know you're going the opposite direction of what the Lord of love would have you to be. Your hope is that he said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them and they follow me. That means the shepherd won't turn you away. The shepherd doesn't judge you for where you've come from. The shepherd won't say, where have you been? He won't ask you how long you've been away. He will simply say, follow me, because where you are is not important to where you are today, where you were and what you've done cannot outweigh where I was on the cross and what I did for you on that cross. John 10, 16, other sheep I have. Here it is. Here's hope. Other sheep have I, which are not of this fold, but them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd, that shepherd is divine. That shepherd is not a pontiff. That shepherd is the only one who died on the cross for the sins of humanity. That is the good shepherd. And when you hear his voice, that's the voice of truth. It's the voice that you've heard in this series that's calling you up, calling you out. Jesus's response to us is, I'm going to bring you because to him, the porter openeth. 
and the sheep hear his voice. He calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. You don't have to worry about, what. well, well if, I, if I leave this church, what's going to happen? Or if I... If I if I step out of this lifestyle and, and into love with Christ, what's going to happen from this point on? The Bible says he calls out his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. That means it's not your responsibility to figure out how you're getting out of your mess. You just have to make the decision. I want out. Take me out, Lord. And it's the shepherd's job to lead us out of error and into light to lead us out of fear and into faith, out of self and into salvation. Jesus will do it all if we believe. When we believe that he's the good shepherd, we believe that he loves us. When we believe that we are not better sinners than he is a savior, the savior saves. And that's why I'm so glad to know. I don't have to know a lot. I don't have to even know where I'm going. I don't have to worry about where I've been. The only thing we have to do is do like even a sheep would do today to follow his shepherd. Focus on the shepherd. Look at Jesus. Listen to his voice as revealed in scripture and do what you know the spirit of God is telling you to do. And the first thing he says to all of us when we're in a mess, when we're in Babylon, when we are gone, He cries out like he cried out to Adam and Eve. And he says, where are you? Not for you to find where you are and to get where he is, but to let you know, I'm looking for you. I'm interested where your situation is right now. And I want to lead you from it. This is what Jesus says to us. And today the invitation is to listen, listen and to let love lead. Because at that time, shall Michael stand up. No more calling. But now he's standing. And that great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. When he stands up, what do sheep do when the shepherd stands up? They follow. There will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that same time, these are for the sheep who refuse to follow the good shepherd. But at that time, thy people, again, God has always got his people all over the world. He's always calling us. And all we have to do is follow to be delivered. Thy people, the shepherd's sheep, shall be delivered. Every one, each one, the one he calls by name, yes, you and me. Every one of us that shall be found written in the book. Hey, if you enjoyed today's lesson in prophecy, be sure to visit our website, changeministry.org slash the highway home. Here you're going to find two visual studies that guide you through every prophetic event from now until the coming of Christ. And you'll even find a step-by-step study that goes deeper into the word of God so that you can find both the peace and the power that comes from the promise of Jesus' return.